delightful to be here, and we are approaching March, and so we are soon approaching the madness of trying to figure out, if you decide to, how to actually create a bracket. So hopefully mathematics can help you determine how you will pick your bracket, and in fact, we will actually learn a method that will essentially make the decisions for you, except you will have to make one very important decision, and that will be a modeling decision that will be your own. And that decision that you make will actually lead directly to the bracket that you have. But we have to walk through some things in order to understand how that's working. So we're going to have some slides that are at a very general level. I'll have a few that go more into the math development of it and are a little bit specific. So, but hang on, because at the end, it, um, it's a very easy method to implement as well. So we kind of move into different arenas because different people have different interests. So first of all, if we're going to work in the ranking, we need to keep in mind that ranking is an ever-present part of at least our society and culture. We have the recent Oscars. Who won the Oscar? It was all over Twitter. It was all over Facebook. These are your friends who, who recently posted on the Oscars. It was, on the news, it was in newspapers. We hear a lot about the presidential. Who's winning? Who's winning today, let alone next fall? And then we have the recent Super Bowl, and who's number one? Who's going to win? Is it going to be the Giants or the Patriots and so forth and so on? Well, inherent in the, each of the applications I just said is who's number one? Who's going to win? Who's number one? But in what we're going to talk about today, it's a little more subtle than that. We're going to try to rank, which means we're going to try to figure out who's number two, who's number three, who's number five, who's number eight, who's number 13. And be like, wait, wait, what? Why? Why are we trying to figure all that out? I just want to know who's going to win. Now, I don't think you do if you're trying to do a bracket. If you really stop and think about what you're doing for March Madness and what you need, you need to know a little more than who's going to win, at least if you want to win the bracket. You're going to do pretty well on a bracket if you can pick the winner. But what you want is you want to have those pair-ups, right? You, in the, each game, that's what you're going to do. Is you're going to say, in this pair-up, this is who I predict is going to win. Well, unless you follow college basketball really closely, there's a good chance that there will be teams that you have no idea who they are, where they are in the country, or how good they are, and you don't know what to do. Then there are teams that even the experts think are going to lose. Almost everyone thinks they're going to lose, and yet they win, and they possibly win again and again. Davidson was one of those teams a few years ago, a player named Stephen Curry. Can we predict those? Maybe not all of them, but we can predict some of them with what we'll learn today. We consistently pick up, particularly in those early rounds, quite a few of the upsets. So first of all, we need to get accustomed to the way that I'm going to represent the data for you. You could represent it in a lot of ways, but I'm going to do it with a graph, where each of the vertices represents a team. So right here I have a game that I'm very proud of. The Davidson Wildcats, who we see here, played uh, the University of Kansas, and we won. And so each of the vertices is a team, and a directed edge from one team to the other indicates it's drawn to the losing team. So Davidson beat KU. Okay? You could draw it the other way, but we're not going to. Okay? So this is the way we're going to do it. So now... You can just listen to me do this, and I guess that would have its own entertainment value. But then the lights are dim, the sun is down, you've had some snacks. So let's actually take a moment and learn from each other what each other thinks about this. So on your chair, there was a picture of me. Let's move to the other page, because you can look at me if you want to know what I look like. And on the first graph, you see this picture. So I want you to look at that, and I want you to turn to someone next to you. It can be someone you know. I know that often you sit with someone you know. How would you rank this? How would you rank the teams? Now, inherent in each of these exercises is that you may not actually agree, and no one is necessarily right. You want to listen to what each other says, because in what you say is exactly the type of information that can help us later. So if you're not agreeing, that's fine. It's just that you need to listen to what each other says, because what you're saying could be what we use in our modeling later. Okay, so let's take a moment and talk with each other about how would you rank this particular season of four teams. 
This can seem like a trick question. It can seem like a contrived problem. It can seem like a grief. You've got team D beating every team. Team C losing to team D but beating everyone else. Team A losing to C and D and beating B and B losing to everybody. That's sometimes called the perfect season. Give me a break. Come on. In fact, that is exactly what happened with teams that are near and dear to where I live and would actually, I mean, if I then, if I started with this slide with where I live, this would be a completely different discussion <laughs> in terms of what happened. Is that Duke did indeed beat the UNC, um, NC State, and Wake Forest. That is exactly what happened. But would you rank those teams that way? Not necessarily, right? Because it isn't just how they play each other. It isn't just how those four teams play. It's what happens more broadly. That will be very important for us to remember later. Because later, I'm going to act like there are 64 teams in March Madness. Because I get confused as to how many teams they're allowing this year. It might be 68, but whatever. They change them sometimes. So let's just say 64 for now. While we're only trying to rank 64 teams, because once we have those ranked, we can predict the bracket, we will actually rank all, it's just under 350 teams, all of the Division I teams. Why? Because of this dynamic. We need to know how they played against everyone that played. We need that information. If you don't want to do that, then you don't need to. Create a smaller system and you can solve it that way. And if you do well, I would like for you to email me and tell me that because I've never seen anybody do well when you ignore the data. So this is what we're going to do to talk about that. How does this get more complicated? So here we have two conferences. We have the conference that we just saw with that, if you will, perfect season. And over here, we have a conference with exactly the same perfect season. Does everybody see it? Okay. So now, turn to the person next to you. I believe this is on your handout. And how would you rank this? How would you rank now? Okay, so talk about that. Okay. So now, switch to this one. What would you do now? What would you do in this case? In the earlier case, we had the team that lost to everybody beat the team that beat everybody in the other conference. So however you ranked it, you had to take that into consideration. But now what would you do? What would you do now? And the answer may be, I'm not sure, and that's fine. That's why we're going to have Matt make some of the decisions rather than us. But talk about if you did have to make a decision, what might you try to use to make that decision? Okay. <laughs> So let's talk about something that we saw in here. First of all, you were way more active in that second conversation than you were in the first. But if you notice, D lost in both cases. In either case, D lost. But in one case versus the other case, D lost to potentially a different team with, that was stronger or weaker. What we talk about is the sense of quality of the win or the loss. It isn't just that you lose, it's who you lose to. It's not just that you win, it's who you beat. If you're a phenomenal team and all of a sudden you lose to a really weak team, that is all over Sports Center. Again, and again, and again, and again. Why? What does that mean? I wonder what's up with them. I wonder if that means, and so forth and so on. We will actually fold this dynamic into our method. You will see it come back. And it's actually this interdependence that we're trying to fold into the method that we have. Okay? This is the graph that we're actually trying to use to rank in order to make a bracket. This is the graph that we have. This is the graph that we sat and were trying to contemplate, possibly coming up with a ranking. This is the one you need to do in order to create a bracket. We need computers and we need math to pop. I can't even visualize this adequately, let alone conceptualize it. And there's a close-up. Okay. 
So what do we do? What we're going to do is we're going to use a method that's used in the Bowl Championship Series. So for those New Year's games, at least that I still call New Year's games, those New Year's-ish games that occur over several weeks that occur, it's the Bowl Championship <coughs> Series that, that ranks the teams. And there are various ranking methods. Two of them use math. In fact, two of them use linear algebra. One is called the Coley method, and one is called the Massey method. I'm going to teach you the Coley method. In the abstract, it brings up that I'll mention the Massey method. It actually says I'll teach that to you. I won't. I will actually just teach you the Coley, but I will mention at the end the Massey. Once you've learned the Coley, you can actually do the Massey very quickly. You already have the matrix. It's just the right-hand side. Well, the matrix you adapt a tiny bit, but it doesn't take much to change it. And this model gives that interdependence of teams. If you are a team and you suddenly lose to a weak team, you're going to drop in the rankings because you are not as strong as a team as we thought you were. And if you're a weak team and you can beat a good team, then we will fold that in as well. And then there will be one more thing that we're going to fold in that I don't think, it, I don't know if it's part of the Bowl Championship Series. I don't know. I don't know what they do with that. And they don't want to tell us because then coaches would try to play to what they're doing. But one thing that Amy and I put into our work, which is what led us to doing bracketology, we don't actually do research on how to do great in the brackets. We do research in ranking and then try bracketology just for fun. It's a very easy, if you teach, it's a very easy way to engage undergraduate students in things. It's just fun, particularly if they know nothing about sports. It's because suddenly they can create a bracket. Like one of my students said, I've never entered the family pool in my entire life, and I'm beating my dad and my brother. And math rocks. And so it's a, it's a nice application. Is that we're going to build in momentum in time. I'll show you that. Okay. So there are two purposes of ranking. There are probably more, but there are two that we need to keep in mind. One is to honor how a team played over the whole season. This is what you were ranked for the way you played over the whole season. Okay? That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to rank so that I can predict how you're going to play. That may be that actually you were really bad for a long time, but man, you're amazing now, and I think you can win now. Okay? It's very important, because if you think of ranking over the whole season, then at one moment we're going to make a turn in this when I'm totally focused on predicting future play. So keep in mind what we're going to do if you've taken linear algebra. Some of you are younger. Uh, if you haven't taken linear algebra, then if you've at least seen 2x plus y equals 6, x minus y equals 4, this is linear algebra. Okay? That's all it is. And what you do is you want to find x and y, what values go in there, such that both equations are true. Well, what are the values? I don't know. Exactly. They're called unknowns. I don't know what they are. You have to figure them out. What we will have here is we will have, rather than two unknowns, I don't know x and y, so I don't know two things, I will not know 350 things. So I will have a, a line, an equation, with 350 unknowns, and I will have 350 equations. Here, I need two numbers I need to solve two unknowns that make two equations true at the same time. For ours, we will need 350 numbers that make 350 equations true at the same time. Okay? That's the difference. So we're going to try to solve an equation like this that will predict how 18 to 22-year-old young men will perform in high-pressure situations. If you at all interact with young men in even low-pressure situations, that sounds impossible. <coughs> That's why this is math modeling. It will not predict it perfectly, but amazingly, it can pick up a lot that we as individuals, and even that sports analysts, we often perform as well or better than a lot of sports analysts, which feels really good as a mathematician, particularly if you don't know that much about sports. Okay, so let's see where this method comes from. Let's not just, I'm not just going to teach you to do it. Let's actually see where it comes from. And it turns out that in what I'm going to show you, there's one part of the derivation that you need to remember. Because if you don't, you can actually come up with a way to create a bracket where it's so not coming from the method that it actually helps you to lose. 
you actually go up if you lose. And I'll tell you when we get there. Okay? All right, so here, we, a lot of times we use winning percentage, right? How many games, total games you win? It doesn't matter who you beat, it just, it's your total games that's going on. And that's just the total number of wins over total games. So here I have the 2008-2009 season in the 10th week. I'm sometimes asked why in 2012 I'm using the 2008-2009 season. Well, there's something you need to understand. Davidson College is near Charlotte, North Carolina. This is the Carolina Panthers. The Carolina Panthers play in Charlotte, North Carolina. And if you follow football at all, this is the last time that I could have had a slide that has this type of result <laughs> for the Carolina Panthers. And if you follow football closely, I may need to adapt this slide in one or two years because things may be changing. But definitely not yet. So that's why I use this slide. So who we have here is we have the Carolina Panthers, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Atlanta Falcons, and the New Orleans Saints. And here are their records. Okay. So we have an 8 and 2, so it's 8 over the total games, which is 10, and so forth and so on. Now there's something that's very important to understand in what I'm going to say. Is I'm going to use two terms, and one of the terms is rating, and the other term is ranking. Rating is the number that you get from whatever system you're using mathematically to determine the strength of a team. Here it's winning percentage. So the rating of the Panthers, in terms of the way I would do it, would be 0.8. I don't, I don't think in percent in terms of rating because of the other methods I do. It would be 0.8, the Buccaneers would be 0.7, the Falcons would be 0.6, and the Saints would be 0.5. Once you have that, you sort in descending order, and then you have your ranking. The Panthers are ranked number one, two, three, and four. Ranking is who's number one. Rating is a number. What does the number mean? It may not mean anything, okay? It's just a number, and you need to know who's biggest, okay? There are a lot of questions you can ask about those numbers, but I'm not going to talk about that unless you ask me about that later, okay? Oops, it didn't feel go. There we go. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier, is that winning percentage does not take into account the strength of a win. And that was definitely true this season. Later in the season, the Panthers are going to play the Detroit Lions. Now, I lived in Michigan. So I feel like I, it's okay for me to show this slide and not live in shame. This was the season that the Detroit Lions didn't win anyway. Any, they didn't beat anybody. They were defeated completely. But later in the season, they were going to play the Giants, who in the 10th week were 9-1. and one. Well, take a second and think about that. If the Panthers can beat the Detroit Lions, they're only showing that they should beat the Detroit Lions. Everyone beat the Detroit Lions. You should beat the Detroit Lions. That doesn't give us any new information. Whereas if we could beat the Giants, that says something more. In fact, take it the flip way. If the Panthers lost to the Detroit Lions, maybe say, wait, what's going on with this team? And it gives you information that way as well. We want that in our method. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the method of Wesley Colley. He was an astrophysicist. And he used something called Laplace's rule of succession. Initially, it looks like an extremely simple change to the method. All you do is you take winning percentage, and in the numerator, you add a 1, and in the denominator, you add a 2. OK, that's what you do? No, not yet, but let's just go with it and see what it does for us. It does have some nice attributes, one of which gives us the method we want. So that's what I've done here, is I simply get Add one in the numerators and two in the denominators, I get new ratings and the rankings stay the same. Right? So that's what's going on. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch. Oops, did I do that? No, okay. I switch. What do I switch to? I've switched their records to what? Remember earlier when we were looking at Duke and UNC and NC State? I mentioned that you want to know how everyone did against everyone else. Here I've kind of done the opposite. Here, I need to have the record of how they only play each other. Okay, so I've reduced it to only their record among the four teams right here. That's all I'm looking at. Okay, why? Because I'm trying to show you how this method works on a small example, and then we'll work bigger. So, in the conference, the Southern Conference, the Panthers were two and one, the Buccaneers were two and one, the Falcons were one and two, and the Saints were one and two. So here we have this rule of succession again in here. 
But this is the important part right here. Notice that the average of those ratings is one half. Okay? You've got one half and one half if you take the average. It's one half. Okay, that'll come back. Now, I'm going to assume that the Panthers beat the Falcons. Okay? I will be giving this talk a week at the Southeastern Section meeting. And I did not think about when I originally made this slide. I didn't know I'd be giving this talk there. It's outside Atlanta. I've already given this talk at, at Georgia Southern College. This slide does not go well outside Atlanta. It goes great outside Charlotte. But outside Atlanta, man, it's like you went to Packer country. I mean, they are fanatical. So they are not, this is, they definitely bring up that this is pretend and it's not fair and it's propaganda. So let's just enjoy my um, fondness of the Panthers, and that's what we're assuming. So then what happened? Here, the Panthers go to three, because now they have three wins, and they have an additional game, and then the, the, um, the Falcons remain, or I'm sorry, they remain the same in the numerator because they didn't pick up a win, but they increased by one denominator because they picked up a game. But notice what happened. We still have an average of a half on those ratings, okay? For some reason, I'm pointing this out, and we'll see it real soon. It's what gives us the method, okay? So, like we've said before, we want to be able to pick up strong wins. We want to pick up if you can beat a strong team and have that come with us. So we're going to use a math trick, which is often used, and here we go. So wins equals half a win plus half a win, all right? That's easy enough. I just decomposed it into two parts. Then I'm going to do the other thing we like to do in math. We really like the number zero. So here, I add a half of the losses, and then I take it away. So wins plus win, or half a win plus half a win plus zero, and I just replaced it there. Then I move the terms, okay? So I move this over here, I move this over here, and I get it there. And wins plus losses, well, we know that. That's how many games you play. We're not assuming any ties. If you want to know how to do ties, that's another discussion. And then I have this over here. Half wins minus half losses. Now, for a lot of students, this seems like a lot of mathematical, like, hand-waving. This feels like math of the worst kind. Okay, a mathematician, I give you wins. You do algebra so that you can write it like that. Good grief. What are you doing? Exactly. How in the world did Coley think of this? He started here, and he ended up here, and this is the line that gives us the method. But that's exactly why it's called the Coley method. Because for some reason, he played enough that he was actually able to work this out. Work what out? Well, that's where we're going now. OK? So I'm going to take this term right here. So this is what we had on the previous slide. And now I'm taking just this part, and I'm putting it right there. So that's what I have. Well, what is total games? Right? It's an enumeration of the games that you play. I played this game, I played this game, I played this game. If I played three games, that's the way my daughter counts. She counts by one, two, three. That's how many. That's what I'm doing here, right there. Total games is one plus one plus one for each of those games I played. For each of the teams I played, I add a one there. And then I multiply it by a half. So it's a half plus a half plus a half plus a half. Where did we talk about a half before? The mean of the ratings of the teams is what? A half. So this can be thought of as one half total games is the rating of the team I played plus the rating of the team I played plus the rating of the team I played. Is it really? No. And that's what that's for. It's approximately equal to that. Is it close? Hopefully. And that's where you have the model. That's where it's not exact. That's where Coley probably went, wow, I really hope this works. OK? And it does amazingly well. OK? So what I've done now is, is that I have wins is approximately equal to, do you remember on the previous slide, we have wins minus, or. Uh, wins over 2 minus losses over 2 plus 1 half total games. And then I just put in what I had for 1 half total games. It's the sum of the opponent's ratings for all the games I played. 
Okay, so now what? Well, do you remember this? This is where we came from. Do you remember that? Is we had winning percentage, wins over total games, and then we did the Coley move of Laplace's rule of secession. We put a one in the numerator and two in the denominator. But now I've got this new thing to put there. So let's look at that. Before we do that, we're going to walk into what I call the mathematical blender. Let's just see how this all comes out. Let's see that it does what we say. So here we go. It turns out that this creates a linear system like this. Okay, I just didn't call them X and Y. I ran out of letters, so I decided just to go for the names of the teams. Okay, so I need to know what P, F, B, and S will be such that all four equations will be true. Well, how did I make this? I'll show you in a minute, but let's just look for a moment. Okay? So what I do is I solve that. It's very easy to solve on a computer. You can even use your iPhone or something like that. You can use online tools like Wolfram Alpha and things like that to do it. And there it is. Okay? Those are my ratings. So here, the ranking's the same, just like we had before. Good grief. How did that help? That was an awful lot of work. I know. But now, we're going to induce that win. Who won? Do you remember? The Panthers beat the Falcons. Okay? Now, let's go back and look. So look what we have here. The Panthers go up. The Falcons go down. Of course. Well, yeah, of course, but at least that worked, right? If that didn't work, you might as well throw the whole thing out. But now, look at the Buccaneers. They didn't play. They didn't do anything. And yet, look what happened. They went slightly up. And look at the saints. Okay, they went up as well. Let's talk about this one. Let's just do the one. Did they go down? Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I flipped which way I was going. Okay, thank you. So let's talk about the Buccaneers. They went up. How do you think that could have happened? Can anybody perceive what might have happened? You don't totally know in these things. You need to be careful. But what do you think could have happened earlier in the season, that if they did not play and the Panthers beat the Falcons and that made the Buccaneers rating go up, what could have happened earlier in the season that caused that? That is not rhetorical. Yeah, what do you think? They could have beat the Falcons the Panthers. Yeah, they probably beat the Panthers. Can you see how that would be? By the fact that I beat the Panthers earlier, now that the Panthers are considered a stronger team, because I beat them earlier, I'm considered a stronger team. Okay? But what if you don't agree with that? Wait a minute. You're not the same team the whole season. Okay. But we had to do research to fold that in. Let's just do it this way first. Okay? All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to enter the matrix and learn how to just create the system. Okay? If you want to just put that system in there, if you teach finite math, the, with uh, Amy's book, Amy and Carl's book that Carl, or the, I'm sorry, that Ivar showed, um, there, I, we're working with a, a, a high school, I believe it is, a high school in New York City, and those kids are going to create brackets, and so they're going to learn to just create these systems and then be able to do this type of thing as well so that they know how to do it. How do you do it? Well, we're going to take a couple slides. They're going to have a lot of math on it, so if you like this, you can see, that you can see where it is. Even the notation, some of you, I just don't know, you're, you look young, so I don't know what you're comfortable with. Then just hold on for a moment, and we'll see how to do it. It's easy. It's just counting. But this is what I had earlier, okay, is rating. So now what I'm going to do is, I, rather than rating, I'm going to say, I'm going to rate Team I. I want to know what Team I's rating is. And it's exactly what I'm seeing here, is I have one plus wins. Well, that's what I'm actually changing to earlier. Do you remember that? It's wins for team I minus losses from team I divided by 2. That's what I derived earlier, plus, and this is just notation to say, plus the ranking of the teams that I played. Okay? Then in the denominator, it's 2 plus the total games for team I. That's what I have. Then I go from here to here by just multiplying that term over. This is known, so I move it over. So here I have my, my ratings that I don't know, and here I have the terms that I do know. And if you are a linear algebraist like me, you look at that and you go, holy cow, that's a linear system. If you're not, it can be like, wow, that's a lot of stuff on a slide. And that's fine. Okay? 
But seriously, this is very easy to derive. And let's see that. Okay, so what do we have? We have three parts, okay? So what we will have is we're gonna have, so here, first let's talk about this. When you have a system like this, you create a matrix <clears throat> with the coefficients. I don't want, I'm not gonna teach you matrix vector multiplication, so I just wanna show you how to form it. That's all I'm gonna try to do. As you see how I got from here to here, I just pick off the coefficients, that's all I'm doing. And then I pick off the, the terms on the right hand side. So when I'm trying to create this, I'm trying, I would call this C, I call this R for rating, equals the vector B. That's what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to talk you through how to form, whoops, I'm sorry, how to form C. You don't form R, that's what you solve for, and how to form B. Okay? So we're going to talk about each of those. Okay, so for B, how do you form B? Well, B is a long vector, like this, and you just have individual entries. This entry is for team I. You just say each row will be a particular team. So you've got the Panthers, and you just say what they are. It doesn't make any difference what order they are. And what this is, if you look at this, it's this part here, this is telling you it's one plus one half the wins for that team minus the losses for the team. That's it. How many wins did you have? Two. How many losses did you have? One. There it is. One plus one half, two minus one. And then you just write that in there. You do it for everybody. Okay? That's that part. The vector R you get for free, because that's well, not really free, that's the part you solve for. Then you're going to find C, and there are two parts. There's something called the diagonal here, and then you've got these off-diagonal terms, everything else. Sorry, that looks a little strange for a diagonal. This is the diagonal right there of that, okay? The diagonal is 2 plus the total number of games you played. That's it. How many games did you play? 5. Good. Then your diagonal element is 2 plus 5. It's 7, okay? Where is that? Right there. Then you go to the off-diagonal. So for the off-diagonal, so if we add the Panthers, the Falcons, the Buccaneers, and the Saints, you order the rows in exactly the same order, like that. Once you've done that, you can fill things in. So then we've got four entries in each row. I'm just going to do two of them here. And I just talked to you about how to find the diagonals, right? We just did those. Now come the off diagonals. So if I'm in this entry, whose row am I in? The Panthers. And whose column am I in? The Falcons. What number goes there? How many games did they play? One, for instance. And what goes in there is minus how many games they played. That's it. Okay? That's literally it. Here, you put 2 plus the total number of games they play. Here, you put minus the games they played against each other. Where's, where's wins and losses? It's called the right-hand side. Okay? And that's how you form it. That's literally the way that system is working. It's that simple. It's, it's so simple that I do this for my, for my students in class, and it's, they love it. Nobody ever misses it on a test. If they do, they definitely feel poorly because nobody else did. It's, it's, um, it's something that most people get, if not everybody. Okay, so this is the system that we had earlier. Okay, so here I have the Panthers, the Falcons, the Buccaneers, and the Saints, which may have been the same, yeah, it happened to be the same ordering that I had over there. I wondered where that was, you probably saw that. It looks an awful lot like an eraser, so it took me a little while to track that. All right, here are a couple questions just very quickly. You can actually look at the diagonal element. You know how many total games a team played, right? You know that. Because how many, how many games did the Panthers play total? Well, what is the diagonal element? That's the diagonal. Because it's two plus total games. So you just subtract two and it tells you how many. How many times did everybody play each other once? So you can see that as well. Okay? The right-hand side is a little harder to dissect in terms of what's going on. But you've got to be nuts to do this for that larger system that we saw earlier. So that's when you use a computer as well, is you download data from the Internet that has, that's in a format 
that gives you what you need. If you want to put other data into that, then you have to actually go out and pull it off internet sites yourself. Okay? So there will be some questions you may ask later. You're like, why don't you do that? That's why we don't do that. It's because sometimes we can, but it's hard. Okay, so again, a, a version of the Coley method is used in the BCS rankings. We have adapted it to see how it does in March Madness. And what we do is we create a bracket, which I'll refer, uh, refer to in a minute how you do that. And we submit, to, submit them to the ESPN Challenge. There are several online versions of brackets, but we do it for this one. And then we see how we do against everybody else. So I'm taking the ratings that we had earlier, and I'm putting Davidson um, as the top, again, being very centristic to where I live, and then putting uh, Charleston second, and then Furman, and then the Citadel. So let's act like we had this as our ranking. The way that you fill a bracket out is you rank the team, you rate the teams. You don't, you can rank them, but all you need is the rating. And for any pairing, you look at the rating, and whoever is the higher rated team wins every time. Because your ranking system is saying that they're the better team. So you just trust it. Now, one way to create these brackets is to actually not agree with it occasionally, to go, look, no way, you are wrong and then you just usurp the math and make your own decisions. But everything you will see reported today, no one in my class is allowed to do that on the ones they submit. You can submit your own, but in, when you do it in class, it has to be math generated. Okay? Does everybody understand how we're doing that part? Because that's the part we're going to see in a little bit. So if this was a round round determinant of four teams, you can already tell who's going to win, right? Davidson, because they will beat everybody. So a little bit, we'll create our own result, and then you immediately see who's going to win the tournament. It doesn't necessarily mean that Charleston will be in the finals with Davidson, because we could have played Charleston in the first round. So it doesn't always tell you who that's going to be. So when we did this in 2009, the Coley method out of... Um, 2009 had just over 4 million brackets. So out of 4 million brackets, um, the point system... In the ESPN challenge, each, uh, each correct win is worth 10 points, and then in the second round it's worth 20, and in the third round it's worth, you just double for each round, for each correct one. So we were in the 62nd percentile. So we beat 62% of 4 million brackets. Uh, Barack Obama did quite well, and then two sports analysts, one did a little bit better than us, one um, definitely did not. And an NBA star, Dwayne Wade, um, did not, he did as well as Mike Golick. So we were pretty pleased with that. The next year, uh, the Coley method did very well. Uh, President Obama got a good result if he was running for election. Not the best in terms of um, trying to do March Madness. Stephen Curry, who's the NBA star from Davidson, um, this is the year my students submitted. Everyone beat Stephen, so they were quite, it was the only time we could beat Stephen on anything related to basketball. So we were very happy. Um, Dick Vitale really, um, he was probably quite verbal about it. He did not do quite well. And then LeBron James also struggled. We did very well that year. But let's see if we can do better than this. This is just straight Coley. You just run it, get the results, you create a bracket. And that's the last part I want to do. So I want you to turn to each other again. If you were trying to predict how these teams would do, even with this perfect season that we had earlier, if you had access to scores and dates, and maybe something else, could something change the way you rated this earlier? Or maybe that's why you wanted to not make it the perfect season ranking. So talk about that for a moment, and then that will lead us into our last little bit here. There's a lot to consider, right? There's a lot you can do. There's a lot that can fold into this. So let's see how Amy and I developed um, methods that would fold into this and how it adapts to the method. I heard a few of you talking about this. It's one of the big things is the time in which things happened. Is that a team, for, that's not quite the perfect season, but if you took in the margin of victory, it might tell you something. Is that if a, the strongest team just squeaked by beating the weakest team right at the end of the season, maybe that means something. Well, another way to look at it is that if a team lost its first five games but won its last five games, that's different than a team that won its first five games and lost its last five games. When you're trying to predict something like March Madness, that's what we're trying to predict pre or pick up in the methods we're about to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to weight the games. 
What does that mean exactly? Well, we pick a function. Okay, that's fine. But the easiest way to think about it is earlier, we count every game as one win and one loss. That's what we do. That's not what we're going to do now. Let's say that in the first half of the season, you decide, you know, it's giving you information, but it's not that critical. Okay, well, what do you mean by that? Is it worth like half a game? How much do you want it worth? Half. Okay, then all of those games, we're going to act like they're half a win and half a loss for each team. Okay? Now for the second half. How important is that? Is it one win? Or maybe it's two wins. What do you want that to be? That's what we're going to do now, is you pick a function that models the way that you see the timing of the games telling you how they'll play. That function is your function, and that function creates your bracket. Okay? And that's what I'm pointing out here. So uh, these slides, um, I didn't know how many of you would be professors, so these slides model the way I present it to my class. In fact, the way I just presented it is not the way I present it in class, and I apologize. I was going to do it the way I do it in class. Why? Because the one that I just told you, where you break it up, is actually one of the better methods to use. So in class, I think the only two I teach them is the one that you, the Coley method is straight up where everything's one game, and then I show them this one. Which is, called, which is linear weighting. Why? This one does terrible. This is typically the horrible weighting to use. And then I don't tell them any more. And then I have them try. This is for math students, by the way. For my finite class, I teach them what I just told you. And that's what I just taught them two weeks ago, was how to do this. So that's, I think that's why it's in my head. But if they're math students, I don't tell them hardly anything. So that then they just, that if I don't tell them anything, who knows what they're going to come up with. And what I tell them is, this is the only one I'm going to show you, and it's terrible. So I want to see what you're going to do. And moreover, when we submit the brackets, I'm going to submit this, and I'm going to submit standard Coley. And most of you, if not all of you, are going to beat me. So what can you come up with? And man, they get really into that. So one thing, if you're a professor and you are highly competitive, you need to rethink how you want to do this. Because I don't mind that my students beat me. I think it's fine. But I, in the, at Davidson, with our kind of small culture, they like to talk smack at me and make fun. And again, I'm not particularly competitive, so I don't mind at all. But if you are, you, I mean, it depends on your relationship with your students, but you wouldn't want to think that through. So here, you're just weighting it by the percentage of the season that you're in. Okay? So if you had 120 days in the season and you're in the 61st day, that's when that game occurs, then the weight of the game is 61 over 120. Okay? This is a little silly. Some people don't like it. Um, this one says that a game on the first day, if you kind of think about it, is zero, so it doesn't count at all. And then, like, if I play today versus tomorrow, tomorrow's worth more. And that's part of the reason it isn't doing very well. Okay? But anyway, it's one that we try. And so this is the slide that's pointing out what I just said, is that a way of thinking, oh, I'm sorry, no, that just points out the, the three parts that I said. The weights lie between zero and one. They don't need to. You can make them as big as you want. Um, the highest weight occurs on the last day of the season. The games on the same day are given the same weight. Allowing the weights to go to be uh, larger than one allows you to pick up lower ranked teams. Okay, we'll talk about that again in a minute. I'll leave that alone for now. Okay, so why would this work? How does this affect the linear system? I'm going to do this very quickly. But this part, when you form the system, it's actually exactly the same. Except now, how many total games did you play? Well, how much of a game did it count? I played half a game, three-fourths of a game, and one game. You add that up, and that's your total games. Well, I won half a game, and I won three-fourths of a game. You put those together, and that's your wins. And I lost one game, a game that was worth one, and that's what you do. And then everything else is the same. That's it. That's all you do. Okay? And that's exactly the way it's coded. And that's why it works. But there's one important thing. That third bullet is to remind me of this. The one thing that you can get in trouble with, and it's really easy to do sometimes, is that if you and I play, so we're going to play ping pong, and we're going to like be so mathy, we're going to use the Coley method to rank us and all of our ping pong friends. So we play ping pong, and I decide that you are such a ping pong player that if I can beat you, 
I get two win or I get two wins, but you get like three fourths of a loss. You don't make those equal. Remember earlier when we had the slide, we said that you add a win, you lose a loss. It was there was always parity between that. If you do not do that, the method falls apart, and that's when you can have teams lose and they they jump up in their ranking. Okay? How do I know? Because we had the most phenomenal research idea that if that only worked, the method would have been amazing. We were trying to work on ties, how to incorporate ties into this. And we had a really cool idea. I don't even remember what it was anymore. And my student, Eric, coded it. And then suddenly we saw a team lose and go way up. It took us a month to figure that out. We, could not, we kept running the code. I think you have an error in your code. Yeah, me too. And he looked at his code. Not only got an error in the code, huh? And then suddenly we went back to the derivation of the method, and that's where it left live. OK, and that's just telling you the part that I told you about the season. So here we have a season. Here we have Appalachia State beating the Citadel on game one, on day one, I'm sorry, beating Davidson on day three, and losing to Furman on day five. Davidson beats Furman on day one and beats the Citadel on day seven. OK? And there you see those different rankings. So here, when you run it the first time, Davidson and App State are tied underneath when it counts as one win, one loss. But when you do the linear weighting, you can see that I very smiley put Davidson winning very at the end because I know how to do these methods. So Davidson won at the most important time, and they beat a good team to win at the most important time. So therefore, Davidson won the conference, which we did this year, so I don't feel like it's too bad to do. Okay? Okay, so here are three that we did. Or four, I'm sorry, four that we did. The, the uniform one, I don't really think of one is that we do. So uniform is all games count as one. Linear is what we just saw, where you uh, go between zero and one on the season. Logarithmic was actually um, not supposed to look quite like that. What we, what we wanted was for this to actually, we actually wanted that plateauing that you get with log. And, um, but we, we finally got the research to work one week before you had to submit the brackets. And suddenly we were just putting in different ones. And it was later that we went, oh, yeah, this is almost um, linear. And then biweekly step is the one where you break the season into so many intervals and you tell me how much to weight each one. Okay, but you can pick anything. Students have used all sorts of things for their weighting. So what ideas would you have? What would you do? Would you try to move fold in? Do you think we're overlooking something like scores? Would you use something completely different? Economic students, man, a lot. They, they use all kinds of stuff in what they're doing. So turn to somebody now and talk about that a second, and then we're going to create a couple of rankings um, using the uh, intervals that we have. slides at the beginning, which made this a little um, different length than I'm used to, and I want to be sure you get out of here close to the time that was, you were told that you would. So I just want to talk about three, three different years that I did this. In 2009, our brackets were entirely done within research. We had just come up with the, the weighting, and so Amy and I worked together with various students, and the best method, which came from Eric, um, was in that it beat 97% of the over 4 million brackets. The next year, I taught my students to do this in a math modeling class. I only teach it in three days, and it's only two days that they really need to know what they're, how to do the method. And the best method was produced by a student. It, he beat all of our research methods, and it beat, it was, it beat over 99% of close to 5 million. One of my favorite students in the class is Jennings that you see here, because Jennings hates sports. And Jennings was like, oh, I really want to try to do this. So I was like, really? I'm surprised. He said, no, no, I think I can finally do it because it's math. It's not sports. He absolutely loved it. And he did quite well with his bracket as well. And then last year, I did it again. Last year was very hard because of uh, VCU going as far as they did. None of the methods picked it up. And so some years you don't do as well. 
This year I'm teaching it in a finite math class. And last every year, uh, Ben and Jerry's in Davidson always um, gives uh, a free ice cream cone to the winner of the class bracket. And then last year, Princeton University Press uh, gave books to our winner as well. So if you want to create a pool, you can actually create a pool with Princeton related to Amy and Carl's book. Okay, so we're going to try this together. All right, we're going to create two different ones, three different ones, and let's see what they'll be, what we're going to get. So I have some Java code that will do this for us. It's, it's a little limited in what it'll do because it won't let you put in any function. If that sounds disappointing, that's good because I have a student right now creating an applet that will actually be on a web page that will allow you to type in a function and then it will create whatever you want. And Ivar shared today that we can probably host that through the MAA, through LOCI, and then um, people can run it through that site, which would be great. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, so um, let's, we're going to break up the, we're going to do the interval. Oh, I have that on the slide, that's right. So you will have three choices um, in, the, in the applet. We'll have standard Coley, we'll do that first. We'll do, you have linear weighting, we're not going to, I'm not going to do that. Oh, oh well, we can, it's just bad, but we can, we can enjoy the poor ranking. And then we'll have the step function, that's the one I really want to work on and see us do. So with the, with the um, step function, you break the season into however many parts. So you tell me that number. How many, how many parts do we want to do? Four, eight? I mean, don't pick 18 or something, or that's the only one we're going to do. And then you have to pick a number. How much is the game worth in each one of the parts? Okay? So we're going to create the carriage house interval ranking. So you tell me how many parts do you want to break the season into? Seven. Seven. All right. So we're going to do seven parts. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure why I'm writing that on the board. So we're going to, you know, let's, let's actually write that on the board. So if I want to remember it later, I can. Um, so I can write it down. All right, so you pick, you pick the first number. What do you want the first seventh of the season to be worth? Um, two. Two? You just made the fundamental decision because now everybody needs to actually make theirs relative to what you chose. So it's actually the first number and the last numbers that are really important. So let's pick somebody else. What would you pick? What do you want for the second seventh of the season? Um, five. Five? Okay, so we're going up. The second, the second part is worth more, okay? Which is often true in terms of what people want. James Barry, what do you think? What do you want for the third? Yeah, nine. Nine? Okay, that's what we have. All right, what would you choose for the next part? What are we on, the fourth? Fourteen. Fourteen. Wow. All right, so it's worth 14 <laughs> wins and 14 losses at that point. Okay, what would you do? What do you want for the next one? So we're on the fifth. Okay, so it's worth just a tiny bit more at that point. They're in a groove. They're in the same groove in those parts of the season, so you really don't rank them a whole lot more. What would you do? Sixteen. Stay the same. Not a whole lot of difference here. Okay, now we go for the last one. All right. So, Mike, what do you want? What do we, Michael? What do you want for the last one? What would you pick for the last bit? The last seventh of the trip. Eighteen. Eighteen. So it is worth more because this is going right into the season. It has the conference tournaments and so forth and so on. Okay, so let's try this and see how we do. So the first thing I want to do for you is let's just do standard Coley. Every game counts as one game. Okay, that's what we did first. And there we go. So Syracuse is number one, and Kentucky is number two. So one thing I want to do really quick is um, I got interviewed earlier by um, some TV people, and it hit me. Okay, so let's not worry about it anymore. And then Wichita State and Ohio State. Um, they're in there. <laughs> we don't have the right ranking yet. This is one that doesn't do as well. So. <laughs> they, won't, they won't be in the top 10. And then if you want the full, actually we could look up Davidson and know their rating, but I don't rank them, which I hit me today because they kept the news reporter kept asking that and I felt bad. I just, just haven't done it. So yeah, we're going to do it again. And now we're going to do the one that we have. Okay, break the season into intervals. So we had a seven, 
And then we have 2, 5, 2, 5, 9, 14, 16, 16, 18. Oh, this, oh it stayed the same. That's surprising. Okay. That's the first time. No, which does No, no, yeah, at the bottom it'll change, but that's the, that's the only time I've seen uh, Syracuse pop. Um, yeah, so if the news media had interviewed me later, I would have said, actually, you can come up with Syracuse still being at the top. Um, I've never had Syracuse at the top in any of the weighted ones. That's good to see. Okay, so we had, yeah, and then it's at the bottom, right, that you begin. It, it, and you, it looks like around here it may be the same. But you get down farther and farther and farther. I mean, we're seeing, this is the top ten that's already changing. That's why your bracket is significantly different than someone else's. And because of these kind of changes, you can pick up people that no one has really seen are beating somebody that makes an instrumental change in how they're rated. Okay? That's why you get that kind of change. Okay? Let's do it one more time. Let's do it with a line. Why? Because students learn a line and wonder why in the world do I need to know uh, MX um, plus B. So let's just do it. This is why. You just don't tell them it does really bad. Okay, so you just want a slope. So what's the slope going to be? So you pick a slope for the line. Three. Three? Great. And there we go. So we have Kentucky, Syracuse, Michigan State. Yes. And so we did get a change here, and we got a... Quite a few. Yeah, there's quite a few changes down in there. Let's try one more, just for the sake of... Um, let's break the interval one more time. Okay, Ivars, why don't you pick the number? How many intervals do you want? Oh, how many intervals? Mm -hmm. Intervals. Um, ten. <laughs> ten. All right. You said you wanted audience participation, so here we go. Yeah. Okay, so what would you pick uh, for the first part, for the first ten? One. One? Okay. Okay. Somebody else? <coughs> Two. Two? Okay. Two. Two. So we're staying the same? Two point five. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Who else? Three. Okay. Who else? Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll come back to that because that's actually not always a bad choice. I've had students do well for that, and I'll try to mention that. Somebody else? How about five? How about right there? I can't. The in the short sleeve. You. you. Yeah. Six. Six. Okay. Two more. Who? Twelve. There we go. And then the tenth part. Laura, you put a lot of work in. What do you want to do? Thirteen. <coughs> okay, thirteen. Here we go. Syracuse, Kentucky, Duke. Yep, we've got that. Okay, I'm going to do one. Okay, just to show you that <laughs> the intervals can be different. Because this is the one I did earlier for the news media. As I said, four. And I said 0 .25, 0 .5, 0 0.75, and 1.5. And then you get something. Like that. But it can be whatever you want. It can be any anything that you have at all. But I want to talk really quickly about. And I think you gave that number where it went down. Mm -hmm. Some of my students did that, where they'd say, in this part of the season, sometimes the students just it's break and they're not trying as hard, and people aren't showing up for the games. I'm going to de-emphasize that. Some people actually de-emphasize the very end. So I've had students, like when Ivar's just picked 10, they'll, they'll actually, they don't actually have equally spaced intervals. They'll have an interval at the end that's the conference tournaments. Because some of the teams that are guaranteed basically to go, they don't even play their starters. And so some of my students will say, that's just not, a, it's not appropriate to say how people are playing against them. So one more thing. The last thing I want to note to you is when I mentioned the Massey method in the abstract. I did the Coley method here. It turns out that the Massey method all you do for the Massey method is you subtract 2 off the diagonal. Once you've done that, you have what's called a singular system. It has infinitely many solutions. So what you have to do is you replace the last row by 1s. And then on the right-hand side, the right-hand side changes. You can look that up in Amy and Carl's book, or you can actually find it in Joe Gowden's book. I actually have that in his last slides. And You can look in the MAA book by Joe Gallion, we talk about this, or you can read Amy and Carl's book. And what it talks about is, is that the right-hand side for the Massey method 
is the one that uses scores. So you can fold in scores into what you do. But I want to point out one last thing with this before, I, before I'm done, is that if you want to do the Coley system, if you want to do that, then you can code, because this won't be in like the applets we put online. I've had students do scores in what they call a bucket system, where if you win between one and five points, then you are this much of a win. If you win between this and this, it's this much of a win. This and this, it's this much of a win. The student that landed in the 99th percentile, that's what he did. He did the bucket system, and he actually put in homes in a way as well. Yeah, we're about home court advantage. You know? yeah. We that is actually in the data set, so we do fold that in. Yeah, we actually will say if you can win. Some student it actually also shows you neutral sites as well. And some students actually weight neutral is more important than whether you can win home or away. Yeah. I don't know. I've had that. I've never tried it. We should put that in sometime. The bell curve. Yeah, like the weighting would be the most, so it's less important at the beginning and less important at the end. We should try it because it's a natural thing to, I mean, it's a well-known curve to try. Yes. What about injuries? Yeah, if you wanted to do injuries, you'd have to uh, be a pretty good coder because at that point, you that's where you say, at this point, it doesn't matter if you're winning or you're losing, these games are not counting, other than if the injury is going into the tournament. And if the injury happened right before, and then you say, for this team only, these are like, like really important to this team. But that gets a little tricky because the other teams are playing against it that way too. So, or you can just annihilate it. You can just say, I'm not really folding in. You, you, you're zero. So you're basically out of the configuration. Yeah, that, that's the way we've tried to deal with it a little bit. Yeah. In the actual NCA seeding, if they actually use a weighting that's um, different for home and away, isn't that right? Like 1.4 win or something? I don't know. Yeah, I actually have never looked at that. I'd be curious to see what yeah. impact that has versus these other ways of doing it and yeah. how that skews their version. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, their, their seating always helps us because they always are off on something that, that often people will say that sometimes what we say isn't that surprising to people. Yeah, let's do two more questions. Yeah, do you have a reason why the uh, brackets, the, the intervals work? where the linear does not? Is there some intuitive reason why that works? Um, the only, no. I, we've, we've tried to look at that, and the only thing that we can come, we've tried, the next year we tried a lot of linear weightings, because we were like, wait a minute, is this always doing bad? Um, I, I'm sure if you got slow enough, it wouldn't do, do too bad. But the, um, the only thing we can figure out is, is that day-to-day -day difference, but I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure why that one has had so much trouble, but every year it's not done well. And there's one in Massey that doesn't do well that we haven't been quite sure. But Amy and I kind of play with it and have fun with it, but we, at some point we need to sit down and work on the bracketology part of it as well. It's often just a fun application for us. So Amy might have, have more of a thought on that than I do, but no, it's usually um, the log that the, the, the log or the intervals tend to do the best. But whether Coley or Massey does the best, you'll never know in advance. You don't know which one. Yeah. You say the uh, actual method they use isn't published. In the BCS, yeah. You don't know if it's this. This is the method that was introduced by Coley. But what they use in the BCS is kind of behind a veil. So yeah. it might, he might be using some things like what we have. Yes? Uh, anybody ever try to apply this to ranking tennis players? Um, we've talked a lot about it. I'm not sure if anybody tried it. My colleague um, at the University of Washington, who my postdoc was with, tried to do ranking on tennis players, but I'm not sure if they used Coley or not. I know that somebody used a variation on page rank on um, tennis players, and they found Jimmy Connors to be the best. <laughs> they did for everybody ever, because it's a connected. It's connected because of the long span of times that they play. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.